yeah thank you guys for joining and for watching on the recording as well um i'm emma and um also in the call is jacob so at the moment we are as far volunteers um and we sort of started working with as far just after um having done a two-month es volunteering placement in sarajevo um so just a little bit of an introduction we spent time working there internally for as far um, on various projects and that included looking at how as far like as an NGO could become more sustainable um, so we did that sort of initially by producing a sustainability investigation document um, we also both work at the moment on a sustainable envirotech startup at university um, which looks at sustainable consumption and production yeah hello everyone um, as Emma said I'm Jacob um, so moving on to kind of this talk today, um, welcome and, and thank you for joining and, and you know those of you that are watching online, um, we're going to talk to you about, as you can see, sustainability, climate change and sustainable business. So there's quite a lot to cover um, and so our aim is to kind of provide you with a bit of a background into what those things mean, why they're important um, and changes that are being made and could be made in the future for the benefit of the planet. Um, and with this information, we kind of encourage you to do your own further research into the areas which more directly affect you, um, your career, your interest, and, and so on. Um, and we also encourage you to ask questions. You can email us. Um, we'll, make, we'll make that available to you um, and we'll do our best to answer those as quickly as possible. Great. So firstly, um, sustainability and climate change can mean different things to different people um, and they definitely have like nuanced meanings and considerations that have to be made. So just to avoid ambigu ambiguity, first we'll just quickly define how we outline these two things um, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, so climate change, based on the definition provided by the UN, is defined as long-term shift in temperature and weather patterns. And that can be through natural events and cycles, but is largely largely driven by human activity. Um, so climate change by its very nature is an international issue and transcends our sort of arbitrary construction of borders. Also, according to the UN, the consequences of climate change now include, among others, intense droughts, water, water scarcity, severe fires, rising sea levels, flooding, uh, melting polar ice, catastrophic storms and declining biodiversity. So can we have the next slide, please, Amina? OK, so secondly, we have sustainability which um, from the UN's uh, definition in 1987 is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So what does this really mean? Um, well, there are a range of sustainability issues and these aren't just environmental. They can include social issues such as labor rights and conditions, um, economic issues like fair, fair payment and, and lots of other things as well. Um, but we'll get more into that later on when we talk about the sustainable development goals. Yes, and um, before we tell you about how we might mitigate some of these issues, it's important to set the scene and justify the need for change. Um, so we're going to take a look at some of the impacts of climate change and unsustainable practices and the ramifications that they might have on the world. Um, there are definitely too many to list, of course. Um, so we've just picked a few um, just to like give a taste of the kind of kind of things that we're looking at. So, for example, um, rainforest data and the carbon content of the atmosphere is changing. As we know, the deforestation of the Amazon, among lots of other forests and rainforests, um, is significantly increasing. And that means that the content of the atmosphere is changing. So as um, more rainforests get pulled down, the um, output of oxygen from those is decreasing and the input into the atmosphere of CO2 is increasing and not being taken out by um, the rainforests, which are some of the biggest absorbers of CO2 at the moment on Earth. Um, and that is obviously um, a huge issue surrounding deforestation. Also, biodiversity is decreasing because of those forests being destroyed and um, they're often being replaced by like one type of plant. So, for example, like palm oil. Um, if that area is suddenly being only propagated by one species, the biodiversity rapidly decreases. Um, also, the area of issue, um, the oceans, our seas are being uh, inundated with unethical fishing, which has lots of environmental ramifications um, and is similarly um, detrimental for biodiversity. Um, 
this overfishing also leads to lots of bio waste from fish trawlers so like those are fish that they might catch in their nets and then um they put back into the sea and like maybe they're like sort of dead or or unable to kind of contribute to the the environment anymore and um so that that's what we call bio bio waste and um finally from fishing plastic and microplastic pollution is um, really increasing in the ocean because things like fishing nets um, and uh, like other fishing related products are going into the oceans and not being taken out. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary Sea Spiracy, that talks a lot more about those kind of issues on Netflix. Um, third is drought and migration. So with the aridification of climates and communities, it means that some areas cannot grow the same products that they used to be able to do so. Um, and this kind of issue leads to climate migration um, because there's a poor quality of life and lack of drinkable water as those areas become harder and harder to inhabit. Um, it also means that animals' hab habitats are being destroyed as a result of those droughts as well. Um, and then finally, in a similar vein, flooding and the financial implications of climate change. So with increased natural disasters such as climate, such as flooding um, and the dramatic weather conditions, um, they put houses and infrastructure at risk um, and those can be really expensive to prevent as well as to build back up again afterwards, which has several economic and political ramifications. So what does this kind of all mean? Um, in a globalised, interconnected world that we, that we live in today, these issues affect all of us, but they don't affect us all in the same way at the same time. Um, as with many issues in the modern world, there's a geographical element, there's a gender element um, and so on. So just going into a, a little example now, um, Bangladesh is a particularly low lying country, which is increasingly being affected by sea level rise caused by climate change. Um, and despite efforts made by the World Bank and other international leaders to prevent Bangladesh from submerging, it's still set to uh, be subject to more aggressive cyclones within 10 years. So this issue is exacerbated by the fact that Bangladesh has less money to deal with this issue. Their infrastructure is weaker and their emergency responses are less equipped than perhaps other countries in the world might be. Um, and this is all kind of despite attempts at foreign aid and, and, and that sort of thing. So this sea level rise will also um, increase outbreaks, outbreaks such as cholera, make it harder to go crops, um, you know, with a, with a kind of good water table. So this is kind of a cyclical issue um, and that's definitely something that needs to be addressed and we need to look to if we're going to come up with kind of solutions to the, to the climate problem. Yeah, and whilst this is definitely true, that doesn't necessarily mean that people in the global north are immune to these issues as well. Um, so firstly, the global north is going to be subject to weather patterns shifting, um, more natural disasters will occur, and these will definitely challenge um, their infrastructures. So especially in countries that aren't used to these occurrences, um, buildings and other like infrastructure um is gonna be really challenged. So additionally, as temperature rise makes some regions like, for example, Pacific Islands less habitable, countries like Australia and New Zealand, neighboring countries, will need to accommodate for climate refugees, which will likely affect their economies and politics. Um, additionally, food production around the world is at risk as things that grow in specific climates like, for example, um, cocoa and coffee will no longer grow in their native regions. And so um, suddenly like food production might change or the types of food that are available will um, like change rapidly. Um, so there are also definitely aspects more close to home that we need to con be concerned about. Um, this is definitely all very interesting and I'm sure almost everyone listening has probably heard of a lot of these issues before. Um, it's probably not anything new to most of you and this awareness is definitely a good first step. Um, so we're going to get a bit more specific now and take a look at how individuals, uh, businesses and NGOs may be affected and affect climate issues. Yeah, so just kind of going, sorry, can we go back? Sorry, go back a slide please, Amina. Thank you. We've just got a few on these. So um, these examples are by no means necessarily the most important, but they're just ones that we think it's it's kind of interesting to highlight. And um, as I said at the start, it's it's really good if you want to do your own further research going forward about any of these issues because they've all got you know you could do a whole talk on any of them. Um, so in our daily lives, we'll be increasingly aware of climate change's impact. So for instance, our health is likely to be affected in many ways with hotter climates, diseases like Lyme disease 
will become increasingly prolific, um, as well as things like malaria and waterborne diseases like cholera that we mentioned earlier. Um, additionally, trauma and anxiety caused by climate issues is having a negative effect on mental health, um, not to mention the myriad of negative impacts that destruction of our climate, social systems and infrastructure, including you know, medical infrastructure and livelihoods will have on us. So that's all kind of tied in with each other, um, interconnected, as, as I kind of mentioned before. Um, secondly, then we have businesses. Businesses are under increasingly pressure to turn more eco-friendly um, and to find you know, eco-friendly energy sources and to invest in technology that doesn't contribute to climate change. Um, businesses are also facing liability issues, so they need to create products that will be resistant to climate change in the future and will be liable if they have not considered this, um, both you know, legally in some instances and to, and to the consumer. Um, whilst many businesses are beginning to consider these issues, not all businesses are moving towards sustainability, sustainability for fear that these changes will decrease their profits, um, and these are kind of often unfounded in the, in the long run. Um, you know, they're not willing to make these changes if other businesses are not. So this is kind of per the tragedy of the commons concepts of which you may be familiar. And, and if not, it's, it's definitely worth a look into. There's some, some good videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, we take NGOs as an example. So they will definitely in face increasing demand on their services and their funds as climate change impacts weather patterns, health um, and migration patterns as well. This will lead to more competition for funding and resources and also harder working conditions for the NGOs whether, wherever they operate themselves. Um, NGO workers will likely need to acquaint themselves with new issues such as increased natural disasters and how best, best to help mitigate um, those effects. And then finally, NGOs which are now um, expanding into global governance would, will face a crisis of credibility and legitimacy if they aren't at the forefront of sustainable change. Um, also on this slide, is it on this slide? Um, we have a video on YouTube by National Geographic, which really concisely summarizes some of these consequences. Um, so for sort of all of the, the past three things that we've mentioned, if you're interested. Have the next slide, please, Amina. Thank you. So um, this may kind of seem very doom and gloom so far. And although our objective is not to, to kind of scare you all, Climate change is indeed a, a scary prospect um, if we don't you know, manage, manage it correctly. Um, but there is still hope. So we're gonna have a look at some of the ways these issues are being solved on an international scale um, before once again, looking, at what, looking into what can be done by individuals, businesses and NGOs. So I'm sure, you all heard of the, I'm sure you've all heard of the COP26 summit in Glasgow, um, which brought together world leaders and activists to discuss climate change issues. Unfortunately, this event was kind of marred by controversy. Um, people have said it was performative and that little has changed as, as a result. Um, you know, in our view, it, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, and, and importantly, when we talk about this, we encourage you to develop your own view and you can disagree. But we think that the real advantage of, of COP26 was that it galvanized international support at the local level, um, raising awareness around climate change and sustainability, bringing it to the forefront of the media, you know, for every news article which criticised the ways leaders act is, acted, grassroots campaigners and activists felt more connected and were legitimised and brought into the mainstream. So this isn't the result we wanted from COP26, but it's certainly better than nothing. Um, and there's no hiding from the climate issue now. Everybody knows about it and people begin to vote with it in mind, um, holding leaders to account who don't recognise that. Right. Uh, and secondly, then we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, there are 17 SDGs which were adopted in 2015 and they include things like, for example, Goal 2, which is zero hunger. It focuses on nutritional and dietary issues, especially for young children. Um, goal five is gender equality, um, focusing on things like equal pay, uh, gender violence reduction and female representation, which is certainly something that as far as looking into very much at the moment, um, sustainable cities and communities, which is goal 11, um, and that seeks to support those living in informal settlements and to improve things like public transport and urban living conditions. Um, now, these SDGs serve as a set of objectives for entities around the world to work towards, um, which is why they cover so many areas of sustainability. As we mentioned before, sustainability is about more than just a 
myopic vision of the environment. And although this is important, there are many other interconnected elements which need to be addressed. So if you want to get involved in the SDGs, do take a look at the UN web website or have a look at one of the many NGOs and charities which support their endeavours. Um, so these are some of the main international efforts, and there is a huge sort of academic debate about this, which we won't go into now, but we do encourage you to further research um, because there is so much more information out there pertaining to these kind of things. Okay, can we change the slide piece again, Amina? Thank you. Okay, so what else? Um, the next part of this talk, we'll look at how us as individuals, uh, businesses and NGOs can help to mitigate climate change um, and the important steps that we should kind of be doing to prevent global warming. So for individuals, um, it can sometimes feel like as an individual, you have no power and you can't do much to make a real difference. However, the choices we make, whether it's buying from certain businesses, voting in a certain way, volunteering for organisations that make a real difference, um, are the things that when combined and extrapolated across populations will help to reduce humanity's contribution to climate change. So some of our recommendations to do this yourselves are to recycle when you can, shop from businesses which are approved for their sustainability, shop locally, sign petitions, vote for parties with sustainable policies and a history of sustainable actions, and that's really important. Um, volunteer for charities, make dietary choices that reflect these concerns. Um, and those ideas will give you, with you, will give you power and, and agency as well. Um, and also it's important that we engage the younger generations now um, as, you know, we and they will be the, the future leaders and will be facing this issue. So if you know about, if you know more about the issue now at an earlier stage in your life, you'll be better equipped to, to tackle it in the future. Right. Um, and then businesses. So that while, whilst businesses are absolutely making the effort in some cases to be more sustainable, uh, for example, clothing brands, it is important that you are aware of some businesses which unfortunately greenwash their products. That basically means that they're like tricking you into thinking that their products are sustainable, even if they aren't. Um, for example, a company like H&M, which has these green eco-conscious um, lines of clothing, um, they are not actually transparent about what these products are made of, who they are made by and how um, the sort of material composition and the effects that that might have on the environment. Um, whereas by contrast, a clothing brand, for example, like Lucy and Yak, which sells clothes that are ethically produced and pay a fair living wage in good working conditions, are also made of organic and recycled fabrics. So you can see that some businesses are are genuinely making the effort to be more sustainable whilst others are just sort of purporting that like sustainable facade to make more sales. Um, additionally, we highly recommend checking out um, independent local small businesses. Um, these products likely have much smaller carbon footprints and are more ethically produced, as well as um, likely having a smaller travel travel footprint, travel miles, especially if you um, you know buy it locally and don't order it yourself. So. Um, some businesses are even, as Jacob mentioned, validating their products for their sustainability externally, which means that more and more products will have breakdowns of their carbon outputs individually. And that can be really useful for consumers knowing what to buy and the exact sort of contribution that that's having to the environment. Yeah, so finally in this section, we have NGOs. Um, NGOs are increasingly an important element in today's world. Um, and they, they're kind of also increasing in their power to, to make real change. So both small and large NGOs work with the government and can facilitate change by pushing funds in specific directions that will tackle these issues kind of head on. Um, they can also make specific changes about the work they do to help those affected by climate change and facilitate open dialogue with, with civil society. So as far, we recently created and are currently implementing our sustainability investigation findings, which were mentioned at the start of the talk. Um, since ASVAR is an organisation that requires a lot of international travel, it's important that we keep considering our travel patterns and carbon footprints across you know, all of our journeys. Yeah, exactly. So regarding NGO travel sort of more broadly, um, planes actually use 25% of their fuel to take off um, and therefore taking fewer flights um, for one journey is definitely better for the environment. And that's something that ASVAR has been taking into account recently. Um, similarly, taking trains and buses is definitely more environmentally friendly. So although this may not always be accessible for everyone, it is certainly doable around Europe due to um, sort of inter-country train and bus networks, which are um, 
uh, often more like cost effective as well. Also only traveling when necessary and ideally having more than one person per flight if multiple people are doing the same journey that reduces like the impact of the NGO and the sort of the carbon footprint of the NGO as a whole. Um, also for participants, especially in um, an organization like ASFAR that involves lots of young people in various projects, the consumption of reusable items could make a real difference. Also considering paper and plastic use um, and encouraging participants to educate themselves on how to make their participation in these projects more sort of eco-conscious in various ways, um, especially like I say, pertaining to their sort of consumption. We're also thinking more and more about how to educate the next generation of young leaders to incorporate climate and sustainability into how they, they plan for the future, as, so as Jacob mentioned earlier, especially as more conflict in the world will be about climate. This is an issue on which knowledge will definitely be needed by our future leaders as we move forward. Can we have the, the final slide, please? Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, um, during our time in Sarajevo with ASFAR, we created a, a sustainability document which offered green recommendations for ASFAR internally so that its practices could be more sustainable. Um, and then alongside our work with ASFAR, we've been developing a, a sustainable business called Verto, which can assess the sustainability of individual products to better inform the customer about the consumption choices that they're making um, at any given time. Um, if you have any questions about either of those things, please get in touch or, um, you know, or any of the things that we've talked about today um, via email. We'll leave our emails on the, you know, if you're seeing this on YouTube on the, in the description. Um, and we've been more than happy to speak to you about, about anything. Thank you very much for listening and we thank you for your time. Thank you.